Willkommen in einem anderen Aufregens Video or welcome to another exciting video. This is part 32 of my Game System History and Theory series of videos, in this case covering in detail the WRG Wargames Rules 1685 to 1845, the public published date July 1979. Unlike my other rules review, I will cover the history and significance of these sets of rules as I feel this is one of the two bedrock sets of rules which have been used by no, most Napoleonic gamers over the last 50 years, even if they may not have been aware of it. I also wanted to add this because I was slightly confused in terms of who actually wrote the rules or designed the rules and I just wanted to clarify that as well. The uh, WRG Wargamer Rules 1685 to 1845 was one of the early sets of Napoleonic rules which used a sequential sequence of play rather than a simultaneous sequence of play. The notes indicate this was based on the system used in the WRG Micro Armor Rules. The rules are still available via Lulu, although the version shown here is a special edition printed back in July 1979. To the best of my knowledge, they are the same rules, although the Lulu version has been edited by someone, so maybe it has been updated. These rules have been astoundingly successful and are still being used today, mainly with 25mm, but also a reasonable amount of 15mm players as well. The separate army lists are good, if simple, and as long as you use the army lists and keep the size of each force to about 50 elements, they give you a reasonable game. The main issue is the game turn scale, which means there is little manoeuvring before any battle or during the battle. I feel the way artillery is depicted is unnecessarily complex, but this is not really a major issue. The rules cover an astounded period and the army lists reflect this. While I do not use these rules anymore, they are reasonably playable and complete. Of course, you need to struggle through possibly the terse text, although nowhere near as terse as, let's say, the ancient rules. And it's best if someone who knows the rules instructs you and in how they're used. However, I must admit, I, I self-learnt these rules and I didn't really consider them a major issue. One aspect which always puzzled me was, who actually designed and wrote these rules? The rules themselves do not say, although constantly the, refer, the rules refer to we rather than I, so I have to assume more than one person was involved in the design and writing the rules. Back in 1969, WRG was formed by Phil Barker, Bob O'Brien and Ed Smith. Now, the order of the names in Wiki is probably alphabetical, rather than implying anyone specific was the main founder of, or, of WRG or, was there any, or there was any hierarchy. It could also imply other things as well, but as the names are sorted alphabetically, I will go with Occam's Razor on this point and just assume they're listed alphabetically. We know that the WIG micro armor rules were designed by at least two of these gentlemen, or two gentlemen at least, as there is a statement which claims two of the designers had World War II experience, or actual military experience at least. It's possible more designers were involved, but I can only confirm two based on the single quote in those rules. These rules also use we, or the micro armor rules use the we rather than I, so it's possible at least two, if not all three of the founders, or others unknown, were involved with the design of both set of rules. The one fact we can be reasonably confident of is that Phil Barker would have been one of the designers of these sets of rules based on the reprint of the rules, as you can see here. I started this investigation due to an error I made in an earlier video. As I knew more than one designer was involved with Wargames rules, 1685-1845, based on the Royal We, or the non-Royal We, that is used within the rules, but I was really uncertain who actually they were. The book made me think the other designer may have been John Curry, which was totally not correct. This is the danger of assumption, and my incorrect assumption was based on actually what I saw here that you can see here now. Unless someone can speak to the original team at WIG to ask them this question, I cannot confirm all the players involved in designing the rules and their exact involvement. I always wondered why there was no credits on the originally published rules. It's possible the answer to this question can be found in the John Curry edited version of the rules. I may even consider buying a copy one day if my curiosity gets too much for me. The uh, rules, that's these rules, have a historical significance as possibly being the first really successful set of Napoleonic rules available in the UK and other old imperial countries such as New Zealand, Australia, South Africa and possibly Canada. In the US, that position probably goes to Empire, first or second edition, probably second edition, which came out in 1975. 
I have discovered while researching this video that the origin, the origin of the unique US style of basing, that is two figures up front and two in the rear on a square base, comes from these rules. I did not realise that this basing scheme went this far back and I find this quite interesting. There was a set of rules which came out in 1978, which I have minimal information on, which was called the First Empire in the US. The First Empire is a real mystery, but as one of the designers wrote an article for the US Wargaming Club magazine back in 1987 called the Midwest Wargamers Association Newsletter, this is a US-based set of rules. I assume it's all US. However, it does not seem to go anywhere and is more of an interesting historical um, aberration or occurrence. Incidentally, the Midwest Wargamers Association newsletter can be purchased today and is filled with interesting articles, although it is a club newsletter, so don't expect anything polished or professional. WIG's first set of deployment rules came in January 1971, was about 20 pages in length, used a simultaneous sequence of play, and was based on the WIG Ancient set of rules. I have to assume this was the first edition of the WIG Ancient set of rules. Using a figure scale of 1 in 15, 30 seconds per game turn, including delays, or if we include delays, 15 minutes per game turn, it used simultaneous movement, orders, and generally required a numpy. The rules are available to be downloaded today if you're interested. The second edition of the Ancient Rules came out in December 71, so the Napoleonic Rules may have been closer to that set of rules, but to the best of my knowledge, the details already mentioned would not have changed. First and second edition Ancient didn't really change that much. The December 1972 version of the Napoleonic Rules would have incorporated the changes added to the third and fourth edition of WRG Ancient Rules if the rules were still being aligned, and I don't think that was the case. The only other set of rules I could find in this period was the TTG rules for the Napoleonic period, originally created for a competition in 74 and published the following year. I suppose one way of playtesting a set of rules. The sequence of play looks surprisingly similar to WRG Ancient 6th edition, or at least the basic structure did. I wonder if there was any crossover occurring here. The July 1979 Napoleonic rules came out between the Ancient's 5th edition which came out in 76, and the 6th edition, which came out in 1980. The 5th edition was still a order and simultaneous move system, but the 6th edition, which still in theory was simultaneous, was beginning to regulate game turns and moving towards a sequential system. The Napoleonic set of rules were pure sequential, similar to the World War II and modern set of rules. In summary, the rules made a complete break from the previous ancient set of rules, as well as being a significant rewrite. While you have to purchase the latest version of Napoleonics, the previous versions are available to download, and if you read them, you can see some type, something that represents significant development between the two versions of WRG Napoleonic rules. The most obvious one was moving the figure scale from 1 in 15 to 1 in 50 for infantry, as well as a plethora of other changes. There is a very old set of rules from Donald Featherstone's book printed in 1963. This game system was used in a later set of rules called Napoleonic Wargaming's rules by Turnbridge Wells Wargame Society. Some pages are available for download and they look like very simple rules, mainly interesting from a historical point of view. I, ex I expect there was lots of club rules around, but generally they did not really have much of a future. It takes long-term dedication and effort to get a set of rules to get real traction, and outside of the various clubs, these type of rules did not really become very successful. But I assume some of the ideas in Donald Featherston's rules may have found itself into WRG sets of rules and other sets of rules. In terms of supporting material, the WRG rules did have a good support in the form of army lists. I only wish I could have got a copy of Napoleonic Army List by R.M. Evans, as it looks rather interesting. But from a rules point of view, all you need is Horse and Musket Army List written by Bruce Cronin. While there is no doubt the WRG set of rules benefited from earlier works and may have been influenced by other contemporary rules, they represent the bedrock of Napoleonic gaming in the UK and possibly in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia and Canada. In the US we can argue the, that Empire represented the equivalent and I suspect this was also in Canada. I found it astounding that more than 50 years later I can still see gamers using the WIG set of rules as they existed in 1979 no less. The state of, the advances, the state of art has advanced from those early days but WIG will always remain one of the keystones in the hobby we pursue to this day. Now let's start reviewing the rules in more detail. The most important aspect of any rules is its scale, as this affects a host of other factors, such as what type of game you would expect. 
what amount of movement and to a lesser extent the force mixes you require. Next most important factor is the game system itself, such as sequence of play, visibility, movement and fire combat systems. This will tell you how historically accurate or otherwise a set of rules is, as well as how playable they are. The gameplay tells us how easy or difficult playing a game is. This requires playtesting as it cannot be derived from reading the rules. This tells you how playable the rules are. Learning the rules is a combination of complexity, rules presentation and examples. Simple game systems can be difficult to learn and complex game systems can be easy to learn. So while affected by the complexity of the rules, other factors are coming to play when understanding this aspect of any set of rules. Final factor to consider is supporting material, which is required for players to create force mixes, set up a game and play the game. Many free rules may be good, but they lack cheat sheets, equipment lists, army lists and scenarios. This requires players to make an enormous amount of effort to simply get a game off the ground. The basing was typical for the area when looking at 15mm figures. But I found it interesting there was a basing for 6mm figures as well. I never really took much notice of this when I used the rules back in basically in the late 1970s, but it's a surprising, but it indicates this is surprisingly advanced. If we specifically look at 15mm figures, the basing and figure scales are well aligned with a base of four infantry figures at a scale of 1 in 50, adopting a similar frontage to a base of two cavalry at a scale of 1 in 40. A base is supposed to represent 40 metres, which is two ranks of cavalry at 1 metres for the front rank horses, or three ranks of infantry at 60 centimetres for each front rank man. The artillery, or two guns, have a frontage of 2 centimetres, or 26 metres. We know the minimum gap between artillery was supposed to be 6 metres, so two guns could have been expected to have a minimum frontage of 18 metres. The British preferred a gap of 10 metres, which gives us something close to the frontage of 26 metres. I expect the British frontage was adopted in the rules, which gives us a surprisingly accurate frontage. I have no idea these rules. I had no idea these rules took so much effort in getting the radical, rather critical issue of frontage correct. This actually shows in a whole range of other aspects in these rules. The only area I cannot confirm are battalion guns, which I have to assume may have had smaller frontages, but I really don't know. And quite frankly, it probably wouldn't make that much difference. If we look at a 1000 point battle, we can have a force mix of 59 elements, which is a rather large force mix, which I would estimate would result in a game of at least four hours, if not longer. This is a Prussian army, which indicates which has a lot of raw troops. Other armies may be smaller. This represents a core size formation of about 9,600 men and 14 guns. While this would not allow you to fight any but the smallest conflict, it represents an interesting game nonetheless. Just a, an interesting note, Napoleonic troop density did vary a lot during the war, but for the early war, this would have been what you would expect to be a positioned along a, about a one kilometre frontage, or about 10 men per metre. In the latter period of the war, where densities increased, this would be expected to cover possibly even as small as half that distance, or about 20 men per metre. This means that the playing area should be 75 centimetres in width, or, more than, or no more than 3 feet if using 15 mil figures. I'm getting pedantic, but in most cases the front line consisted of two lines of troops separated by a reasonable distance. In attack formation, let's say a regiment, this was often much deeper than it was wide. Let's see what it looks like if we deploy this on a playing area using WIG rules. This actually shows a possible defensive deployment based on Prussian 1813 manuals, excluding the artillery. I have never seen anything like this on a playing area in my life using WIG. In this case, the frontage is 25 elements wide, each of 3 cm, giving us a playing area frontage of 75 cm. When attacking, the frontage uh, would be probably much less and density greater. Personally, for a formation of this size, there is too much artillery. Yet this is allowed according to the army list. I'm a bit uncertain why is this the case, and it may be an army list issue, but I suspect a player would reduce the army could reduce the army and beef up the cavalry to get something that may be a little bit more historically accurate. I mean, I'm not saying it's not historically inaccurate. It is possible for a, a formation of this size to have two batteries of guns. It's just it wasn't that common. Cavalry also supported the infantry and squadron size formations in reality. Um, WRG doesn't really allow this, um, uh, or maybe it does. Perhaps you can actually get your six-element um, cavalry unit and divided into three elements. Um, 
I must look at the point system to see if that adds points to it, but that would be probably the more historically accurate way of depicting cavalry. The ground scale is 1 inch equals 50 paces, or 20 inches per mile, or 1 in 3168 scale for 15 mil figures. This is a rather good ground scale to use and is a significant increase over the previous versions of the rules. These rules were really aimed at players commanding a core size formation rather than the division or brigade as previous or as the previous WRC set of rules. I think this is a critical factor in their success. The rules indicate the playing area can range from 160cm to 360cm wide for 15 mil figures. Perhaps a 1000 point game requires 100cm which is a bit large but at least is in the ballpark. The depth ranges from 120 to 180 centimetres. If we assume the lesser for our smaller game, we end up with a playing area of 160 centimetres wide and 120 centimetres deep, or five and a half feet wide and four feet deep. This is not a small playing area, but for the period was probably the norm. Historically, the width should be closer to four feet wide by four feet deep. But we are quibbling over details, and there is nothing wrong with a 1,000 to 1,500 point game being played on the smaller recommended playing area as stated in the rules. WRG loves the concept of paces, which I normally dislike as it adds an extra calculation for any game. However, one excellent aspect of the system is you can use any base width you like and all other distances are adjusted accordingly. If you were to use 4cm wide bases, then an optional front line for a 1000 point game becomes 90cm with 30 centimetre flanks, which I normally fill the terrain. This is probably more accurate. I must admit I normally use 15 centimetres on the flank rather than 30 centimetres, which is not technically correct, but suits my portable playing area. This makes for a very nice playable playing area. So, you know, even though the basing doesn't actually provide basing for four centimetre wide figures, there is no reason why you can't adjust accordingly. You just need to do the calculation between paces and centimetres or inches as you measure for movement and fire combat. Each term is supposed to represent a maximum of 30 minutes, but this includes an enormous amount of wasted time. Each pair of player terms represents what can occur in 160 seconds. Now, of course, uh, what can occur in 160 seconds is not going to take 160 seconds. You could probably telescope that out to five minutes, but that basically assumes 25 minutes people are sitting around twiddling their thumbs. There was a lot of thumb twiddling during the Napoleonic Wars. I'm not quite sure if there was quite that much. Anyway, 30 minutes per game turn, ignoring what I've just said, is actually very reasonable, as playing the initial contact of Marengo would, as a result, last eight game turns in that case, which makes a reasonable game. The French counterattack would be much shorter at three game turns or a bit or abouts. Irrespective of history, a game with a force mix of 50 elements should normally, optimally, be no longer than eight game turns. Otherwise, the game will take too long for a comfortable day length game. The rules do have a rather complex terrain setup system, which I remember as being rather painful to go through. While it works and does give you a game, I would suggest a system based on an actual battlefield, or perhaps agree how many terrain pieces should be deployed, and then one player deploys and the other selects the side. Terrain setup is always hard, as you don't want to spend too much time doing it, yet you don't want to play on a billiard table. You also need to avoid terrain which gives someone a significant advantage. For the period these rules uh, were published in, the terrain setup system was extremely reasonable, detailed and accurate. It's just that the state of the art has moved on since then. The sequence of play is a classically simple I go, you go sequential system, which at the time was a revolution for Napoleonic's gaming anyway. Unlike more modern rules, shooting and melee occurs before movement. Again, during the period this was reasonably common, but these days designers have determined playing is more fun when you move and then shoot and fight all in one sort of sequence. However, there is nothing wrong with this system where melee and shooting occurs in the following game turn that you move. It means that you have to basically think ahead. As you would expect in a core side, side, a scale game, the CNC is a core commander equivalent, and there are divisional brigade sub-commanders, I would guess. I would guess you would normally have three sub-commanders with one CNC, and that would be probably a typical force mix deployment, giving each sub-commander four to five units to command. Probably have maybe less sub-commanders. From memory, I rarely had more than two. But anyway, uh, historically, that's what you would probably aim for. 
The command, command effects are reflected through the reaction test, which we'll look at in a little bit in a little while. A general is considered to be in control of a unit, which means he is with the unit, or within 30 centimeters if it directly controls the unit, that is directly subordinate, or within 60 centimeters if it's indirectly controlling it, or it basically controls it through some other commander. When a unit is under control, either direct or indirect, it gains a bunch of reaction test modifiers. If not under control of any commander, they suffer negative reaction test modifiers. This system is conceptually simple. There are other effects in terms of combat, but the primary effect is affecting the reaction die rolls, which is the critical element of these rules. The one magnificent aspect of these rules is there is no order writing re required. This was again another revolutionary change for Napoleonic set of rules. Now the downside of having no orders was the use of a rather complex reaction test system. It may seem daunting at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's not a major impediment. The only issue is these type of reaction tests are designed to stop players from doing what they want to do, and designers these days have realised it's better to restrict how many things a player can do instead, and let them do each of them to its end. It's also quicker that way. The main aspect is speeding up gameplay. Each time you want to do something and then spin a dice to discover you can't do it means you have expended time and effort for no effect. I expect this is why the WRG PIP system came into being. On the other hand, it's a lot better than order writing, so don't, I'm not saying in any way or form this is a criticism of the rules. Let's look at an example of the reaction test. In this case, it's to conduct a charge. Each player spins a d6, and the result must exceed the modified total of what is called reaction points. As you can see, charging into a square is not easy, and charging foot in buildings also not easy. If charging in the front of infantry in line, or uh, if charging in the f into the front of infantry in line or column, and you are not disordered or sh shaken, you will probably always achieve it. You can see the effect of a, gen of a general here. The general does not control your unit and you spin a one, you cannot charge home, for example. The rules divide troops into regular and irregulars and have four morale classes or types for each group. In most armies, the only irregulars you will possess are levies, which tend to be artillery crew. Morale has a hand-to-hand -hand effect and which Roar and Levy getting a minus two modifier. Actually, the enemy gets a plus two when facing this troop class. Elite gets a plus one when charging, and veterans get a plus one when fighting anything except other veterans. Morale also has an effect on reaction tests, with Elite and veterans getting good modifiers, and Roar and Levy getting pretty bad modifiers. Once Roar is routing, it's pretty hard to rally them, for example. These rules support four troop states, steady, unsteady, disordered and shaken. Disordered and shaken are the key and bad troop states to avoid. Disorder rules are the bulk of the troop state rules, with disorder ending when the cause is either removed or the other classification disorder when the unit spins a rally, which requires a reaction test. Shaken troops also have two basic subclasses, one which requires a rally to recover and the second is incurable. Let's look at movement. Where can I start? These rules dedicate a lot of pages to movement. While it's true some of this includes formation changes and moving across unusual terrain, there is a surprising amount of restrictions and guidelines for charging, countercharging, feint charging, evading routes and pursue. It must be remembered these rules were removing the restrictions of orders and trying to replace them with other rules, a lot of rules. If you allow every unit to move freely every game turn, you do not end up with anything that resembles reality at the scales we're using in these rules. You need to restrict what players can do using reaction tests and lots of movement rules. This is not unusual in other rules and was the state of the art in its day. When I look at the uh, movement rates, um, it makes me think about exactly how mobile a typical game would be expected to be. Using 15mm, a line infantry element could move 150 paces, or 7.5cm per game turn without shooting, 5cm if shooting. Playing area is typically 120cm deep, so if a foot infantry element that wished to move half the depth of a playing area would then need to spend between 8-12 to 12 game turns in doing so. This depends on opposition, which I would assume would exist, so it would err on the longer length. As a typical 50 element per side game could be expected to take one hour to execute three game turns with experienced players, and longer if players are not experienced, it's clear setup time is critical because you're simply not going to be able to move your infantry from one flank to another. All you'll be able to do is basically move forward, 
about um, half, if that, depth of uh, playing area space. The rules support all the formations which typical Napoleonic players love, especially square. This is a major focus. There is a major focus on skirmishing, which is a nice bit of historical accuracy. We can argue if the way they approach this was optimal, but you really saw the difference between skirmishing, or you do see the difference between skirmishing focus of the early French compared with the early coalition nations in a very organic and historically accurate manner. The fire combat system uses the game system of including all possible fire combat options and values in a single table, which is a good thing. This is common with rules which possess a few troop types or weapons, but these rules provide an extraordinary level of additional detail in its fire combat system which you typically not expect when you try and put everything like this into a single table. As the rules cover um, such an extraordinary period range, this may be expected. Let's look at an example of shooting. First we identify the shooter type, let's say mass musket fire by steady regular infantry. Then we identify the range, which in this case there is a long and a short range. Long range is 200 paces or 10 centimetres for 15 mil and short is 100 paces or 5 centimetres for 15 mil. Then we have to identify a target class, which could be rapid, dense, normal, clump, disperse, covered or protected. There is a large number of rooms, rules which you have to go through in, that assist you in basically defining what the target is. If, let's say, we're firing at a normal target, the possible results are three, well, at long range is 456H. This basically means that on a roll of 456, there is one hit. Now, if you can see a result there, for example, if you look at hand grenades, where it's 45H and 6 double H, double H means two hits. And that's pretty much all you need to know in terms of how to determine hitting the target. Now, there is some um, additional complexity in relation to uh, artillery. In most cases, each hit represents a figure that needs to be removed. But with artillery, there is an additional die roll that you need to throw in order to determine what happens to the artillery. The system is simple, but when you first view the chart, it can be daunting, but experience does assist. Okay, we've uh, inflicted casualties. What is the effect? Well, the effect is, as many things are affected in this rules, a result of the reaction test. Once you've suffered hit from fire combat, you, may, you need to take a reaction test. Generally, unless you've suffered a large number of hits in the current player term, you'll generally pass. Raw troops have the worst of it, with an auto fail or a 1 to 3, assuming one hit was received, for example. There's always a chance of failing, and failure means moderately bad things will occur. The uh, close combat system, or hand-to-hand -hand combat system, is rather different. Um, it uses a much simpler chart with, with a list of modifiers which are used to determine if either side has an advantage or not. As you can see, if neither has an advantage, mounted against foot has a result of 4, 5, 6, triple H, and foot against mounted, 6H. As you can see here, foot better have some advantage when meeting mounted. Even in that case, mounted get a double hit on a 6, while infantry only get a single hit on a 5 or 6. Of course, the real issue is getting the mounted to charge into contact which is where the power of square more formation comes to the fore. As with fire combat, if you suffer any hits in hand-to-hand -hand combat or close combat, you will be required to take a reaction test. Now, on average, um, if you actually lose more, if you've taken more hits than you've inflicted, you're in a pretty bad way because your starting factor is six, which means it's an auto fail. If veteran, there's a minus one. If charging, either minus one or minus four in addition. But basically, having more hits inflicted on you than you inflict on the enemy is normally a very, very bad thing. There are no actual rules where there is an automatic um, loss condition in the game. Each player keeps on fighting until one concedes. If neither concedes, then victory is determined by casualties inflicted and objectives held. If one side has a 10% or more advantage over the other, then that side has one. The one point you need to understand is that not much actually occurs during a typical game and each game term represents a very small slice of activity, so this is basically expected. As a result, it would be difficult to play a game to some form of obvious conclusion within a reasonable time period, assuming either player suffers some re reaction, you know, assuming neither player suff suffers some kind of reaction test initiated catastrophe, which is possible. 
at this time scale, um, you know, this kind of flow is not unusual, which means the, uh, the difference between victory and loss is, is pretty fine difference. Let's take a look at the rules layer. While many people complain of the unusual wording style of WIG rules, I rarely had any issues with the Napoleonic rules, apart from a few unusually worded rules. Most of the rules are clear and complete. A lot of work went into creating these rules and the results really show. The rules, rules do have a lot of what I call commentary, which is good when learning the rules, but can make referencing more difficult. I actually class this of pretty much all the WRG rules um, quite clear and easy to understand with minimal issues. It, it's, it's almost as if someone edited the, uh, the rules to take out all those unusual double negatives and double positives, etc. However, the largest issue with the rules is a lack of cross-referencing, which is something all WRG rules have as an issue, and in fact, many other rules besides WRG, so it's not unusual. Trying to find that all-important rule can be difficult, but again, I must admit the layout of these rules is such that most relevant rules are contained into a single chapter. Once you remember that a rule exists in, let's say, the reaction test section, rather than, let's say, fire combat section, you can actually quickly find it. So, you know, the cross-referencing is an issue, but uh, I, even in these rules, I don't find it a major one. However, if you're going to employ unusual troop types, you need to research this before a game because that can cause some difficulty, not so much in understanding what needs to be done at a particular point in time, but in trying to understand how to use your unusual weapon system, such as camels or elephants or something of the nature. These rules do have what uh, I would call special rules. However, most are placed where they need to go. So if you want to find the rule which applies to, let's say, elephants in close combat, you can generally find them in the close combat section. However, these rules do have a lot of special rules. And if using unusual troop types, you need to carefully study those troop types before a game. Otherwise, as I've indicated earlier, you'll waste a lot of time in trying to understand how to use those troops most effectively. When you actually use them in a game, it doesn't seem to be a big problem because you generally find those special rules in the sections that you expect to find them. While not specifically related to special rules, it's sometimes hard to get an idea of what some basic concepts or troop types uh, are supposed to, or how they're supposed to be used. A good example is raw troops. To find the overall effect of what being raw means, you need to jump around a lot, especially between reaction tests, fire combat, etc. Artillery is a bit like this as well. Why am I worrying, you know, for example, why is my crew um, levy and uh, my artillery still seems to fire adequately? It all makes sense when you play a game, but um, when you actually are presented with these unusual troop types, you wonder, well, whoa, my crew is levy. What does this mean? And if you haven't actually researched it up front, you can spend a lot of time or time wasted playing in the game, trying to find out what it means. So, as I indicate before, with a lot of unusual troop types, and also even fairly standard things like what does raw mean, for example, and also the difference between veteran and elite, you may need to do a little bit of research up front, uh, because it's not that clear intuitively. Now, this doesn't affect you playing the game, it just affects you in terms of using the troops that you have which is, you know, in some ways a good sort of effect, but nonetheless, um, you know, something that does require some pre-work before you play a game. The amount of record keeping on the playing area is minimal, which is a really major plus. Uh, this does require you to have a single figure base. I mean, under the standard rules, you do need to have single figure bases so you can take casualties. If you do not possess this, and I certainly don't, because it's actually rather annoying having single in in infantry element bases, then yes, you do need to have strength point, strength point markers, probably um, a one to three for infantry and a one, one hit for cavalry, etc. Troop order markers are also required, but generally the playing area is kept clear of markers. And in fact, most of the markers you can deploy, you could use possibly things that may even belong in a playing area or don't look really that bad, green objects, etc. to match the actual terrain. This set of rules will not hurt your head apart from some minor calculating when you need to add up a couple of numbers together, etc. Reaction totals, etc. before you can spin a D6. There is no need to be able to do long division in your head. This is a major plus. While there is a six, while this is a D6 dice game, it is not an exercise in mass die rolling. Although if you have four elements of line infantry shooting another four elements of line infantry, 
Both players will probably spin 4d6 in a single die roll, because why not? In the area of supporting material, these rules are well covered. These rules, for you know their time, had an awful lot of supporting material. This was mainly created by other people or companies, but I know of at least two sets of army lists, for example, created by two different people and two different companies. However, in terms of scenarios, I've not seen much of those. These are very much a point-based competition set of rules, not really a set of rules designed to reproduce a historical conflict. This shows an example of an Austrian army list. The point system is not simple, but this army list makes it as easy as possible to create an army. This one, this only shows the infantry section, for example. As you can see, in this case, the Austrians must deal 10 battalions of light infantry, each consisting of 16 figures, or four elements, of which one element in each of the battalion can skirmish. This cost 520 points, and in a 1,000 point game, basically you've expended half your points. The use of army lists is important, as large amounts of artillery will make for a poor game. These army lists contain possibly more artillery than they would normally be comfortable with, but it doesn't go overboard as per the, you know, the guidelines you often find in the rules, which I think is 25% of the points can go against artillery. It's, uh, it's important to keep your artillery total on both sides as low as possible because too much artillery will generally ruin your game. Look, in conclusion, these rules are surprisingly good and continue to be played today. There's not many other sets of rules can, that can actually say this. So, you know, I, I have to class this as possibly, for its time, probably one of the best sets of rules around. The only issue is that some games between experienced players do end up being, being rather boring, with each trying to force an unfavourable reaction test in the enemy via the use of long-range artillery fire, for example. This is especially an issue if too much artillery is fielded. Personally, I would prefer... I mean, it's also an issue when you've got two even sides. If you have two players with even sides, the first person to attack typically has a slight disadvantage, and if the players are good, that disadvantage is all that you need to lose the game. This is a classic issue when you play a game which uses victory conditions which rely on eliminating things. Personally, I would prefer uneven games... But uh, at 5 to 7.5 centimetres of move infantry, that would require a very long game, so it's not viable. And, and of course, the reason for that is if you're going to have an uneven game, the attackers generally would have to cover a fair amount of the playing area, and it simply takes too long to do so. My advice is to keep the points down to comp competition level 1,000 points, or a maximum 1,500 points, and you'll have an enjoyable game. I've never personally tried uh, big battles with teams, that is more than one player on each side, but I've seen many of them being played and it seems to work reasonably well. goes uh, without um, question, if you do have team games with each pair of players having, let's say, a 1,000 point force mix, the um, game system works very well, but um, each pair will actually be having to a large extent, a separate game from all the other pairs, um, which is possibly not that uncommon with big battles with teams on either side. Now, if you want a big battle with just two players, that is, you want to reproduce a multi-core conflict with just two players, these rules are probably not optimal. The scale simply does not allow it. The game will take too long. You could probably do it if you wanted to set up a game and have it uh, in place for several months, where every, sim every Thursday evening... Your buddy comes over and you play one or two game turns, but that's probably the best way of playing a big historical type conflict. It's kind of difficult to find a comparable set of rules here. Um, you know, in the queue in the UK during the period, there were many rules similar to this, but you can't really compare these rules with, let's say, rules that existed in the US at the time. On the other hand, these rules did form the bedrock of, I think, Napoleonic gaming particularly in the UK, so I suspect a lot of modern rules probably owes a little bit of um, genetic material from these rules. It's difficult to say. But anyway, if we look at specifically, these um, rules use the same scale as Ilan, which is a free set of rules and field of battle. And Ilan, probably being the closest to WRG, I've been told actually Ilan was a um, basically based on WRG, providing more, I assume, playability uh, and historical accuracy, if that's possible. I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but one point to really re-emphasise, the designers did a very detailed job concerning element frontages. The infantry and cavalry frontages mess, mesh in with the most common understanding of standard frontages of these troop types. Even the artillery, which are placed in, on an unusually narrow base, meshes in with the two-gun scale. I personally would have kept the base width the same and simply made the element scale three guns per element, 
But then it would have been hard to depict howitzers and guns were often used in pairs, so I suspect the designers' choices were correct. A lot of thought has gone into these rules, and the more I reread them, the more I basically discover, wow, they've added that bit of interesting historical accuracy or scale accuracy. The only real issue with the rules are that the use of the game systems within the rules have been found not to be optimal. The plethora of reaction tests, the detailed and prescriptive manner movement is conducted, and the, and the many game functions being sub, and many games functions being suboptimally executed, um, basically extends the game and adds a lot of unpleasantry to or well, things that are a bit of a burden to gamers. However, in defence of the rules, what was created was a quantum leap forward compared with other rules of the day, either in terms of you know both in terms of improved game system elements such as the removal of orders and in historical accuracy, such as the levy drivers for artillery. Apart from reformatting it, possibly converting the base width to a standard 15mm 4cm, which would be so trivial as to be really not necessary, creating cross-referencing and possibly example guides, there's little you could do for these rules. For experienced players, none of these suggestions are really necessary, but for new players would be useful. This ends my video, part 32 on WRG Wargame Rules 1685 to 1845. Even if you never use these rules in a game, I would strongly recommend you getting a copy. It's filled with interesting concepts and a surprising level of historical detail. Now you can see that on Emma Fahil, Heimatland zu Kampfen.